The title of this segment is called African Americans in the Shaw 54th Regiment Memorial and Unveiling. Um, Catherine Grover is an independent researcher, writer, and editor, and completed the publication to heal the wounded nation, African Americans in the Robert Wood Shaw 54th Regiment <coughs> Memorial in 2021. She's also the author of Make Away Somehow, African American Life in the Northern Community, and The Fugitive Gibraltar, Escaping Slaves and Abolition, Ab Abolitionism in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Along with Janine De Silva, uh, Grover researched and wrote a, a historic research, resource study of significant sites on the historically black North Slope of Beacon Hill in 2002 for Boston African American National Historic Site. She has also provided a research assistant to the Massachusetts Historical Commission and the National Park Service's Underground Railroad Network to Freedom and prepared numerous national registers of, register of historic places nominations of African American and, and Underground Railroad properties. So would you help me welcome Catherine Brooke. Hi folks. All right, um, it's Memorial Day in 1897. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. It's been more than 30 years since the African Americans of the 54th Regiment of Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry returned to Boston from fighting in the South. By 1897, the youngest of them, who enlisted as a drummer when he was 13, was then 47 years old. America's C. Tab of Boston one of the first nine men to enlist in the 54th, would have been the oldest, somewhere between 80 and 95, had he lived to see the memorial dedicated. But he had died 27 years earlier. By 1897, too, the three prime movers for a Shaw Memorial in Boston, Senator Charles Sumner, Massachusetts Governor John Albion Andrew, and the well-known caterer, probable fugitive from slavery and helpmeet to countless other fugitives, Joshua Bowen Smith, had passed away as well. <clears throat> it was left for a committee of Anglo-American men to realize the Shaw Memorial, a project that Joshua Bowen Smith proposed in 1863 within days of Robert Gould Shaw's death and burial at Fort Wagner in South Carolina. The study I prepared for St. Gaudens National Historical Park <laughs> aimed to describe and analyze the role that African Americans played in the creation and use of the Shaw Memorial. And my aim in this talk is to discuss one particular aspect of that venture, how African Americans figured in planning and participating in the 1897 unveiling events. Hard to do. Joshua Bowen Smith had known Robert Gould Shaw and his family since Shaw was a boy, and he was also close to Sumner, who he revered for his role in the national fight for legal racial equality. When Smith first went to Sumner with his idea to memorialize Shaw, Sumner thought it best to wait until the war was over to undertake a campaign to create it. When the campaign began in 1865, Smith himself pledged $500, and both Sumner and Boston newspapers reported that Smith secured from two to four thousand dollars in pledge, pledges from African American Bostonians and others. Edward Atkinson, the treasurer of the Shaw Memorial Fund, stated in 1897 that Smith did not make good on his pledge, but he didn't note the fact that in 1879 Smith had died in poverty, in large part because the Commonwealth never reimbursed him for provisioning the 12th Massachusetts while it trained in Boston in 1861. The treasurer, himself loath to solicit even pledged funds, ultimately counted no African Americans among the monument's financial backers. As the historian Kirk Savage has pointed out, one of the great ironies of the Shaw Memorial is that a white committee and a white sculpture sculptor, sorry, only one of whom had abolitionist credentials before the war, created a monument to Shaw and to his regiment, a, quote, coupling of the races, as one Springfield newspaper put it, that had apparently never occurred to Sumner and Smith, each in his own way persistent 
and vocal advocates of racial equality, yet each wedded to a statue of Shah alone on horseback. Had it not been the, for the overriding influence of the Shah family on Augustus St. Gaudens and the Memorial Committee, this sculptural coupling would very likely not have been realized. There was more or less a formula for unveiling monuments in Boston and I suppose everywhere else. There was a procession involving marching bands, all sorts of military and quasi-military groups, orations and the actual unveiling. The Shah Memorial, whose installation was completed a week before Memorial Day in 1897, was covered by two large American flags until that moment. You can see them on the ground in this image. Um, well before a thought had apparently, had apparently been given to inviting surviving members of the 54th to the event, the committee sought the presence of the 7th New York, Robert Gould Shaw's first regiment, all white men. Treasurer Atkinson, however, allowed that, quote, in view of the event which is to be commemorated, a colored man ought to take some part. <laughs> the, choice, the choice would rest between a member of the 54th Regiment, if one can be found competent to speak, Principal Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee, Alabama, ex-Senator Bruce of Mississippi, or some other representative man. Bruce, once enslaved, was the second African American to serve in the United States Senate, and Washington was the darling of the North's enlightened moderates. Harvard had granted him an honorary degree the year before. The fact that Atkinson, who before the war had identified as an abolitionist, expressed doubt about the speaking ability of any member of the 54th, illustrates both his closet racism and his profound ignorance of the men being memorialized. The 54th, in fact, included men who became lawyers, legislators, ministers, and teachers, all accustomed to and very <coughs> likely adept at oration. After the war, that 13-year-old drummer, Henry Augustus Monroe, became a Freedmen's Bureau agent, a doctor of divinity, Sia, and, and that too, and pastor of, among other pulpits, thank you, oh look, a big block of wood, there. and pastor of, among other pulpits, St. Mark's African Methodist Episcopal Church in New York City whose already large congregation grew so quickly during Monroe's time there that it twice had to be moved to bigger sanctuaries. At the suggestion of the Shaw family, the committee asked the philosopher William James to give the principal address at the ceremony after the unveiling, which was to take place at Boston's Music Hall. James's brother Wilkie had commanded one of the 54 companies and had died in the early 1880s and Atkinson asked Booker T. Washington to, quote, make a response on behalf of your race and people to James's address. Having secured these two speakers, the committee realized that, realized that it had, as it said, left the soldiers out. But the soldiers the committee most had in mind were principally the 54th officers, who were all white when the regiment was raised in 1863, and virtually all white by the time it was mustered out. I was unable to learn from any sources how the so-called battalion of survivors of the 54th came to be included in the procession, but it was probably through the inf influence of Norwood Penrose Hallowell who agreed to lead it. Hallowell and his brothers were thoroughgoing abolitionists before the war and persistent advocates for racial equality afterwards. Penn Hallowell had been a lieutenant colonel in the 54th before being transferred to the command of the Massachusetts 55th, created from the surplus of 54th recruits. About the same time, Wesley Furlong, a sergeant in the 54th and president of the Shaw Veterans Association, had been urging Robert Gould Shaw's mother, Sarah, to prevail upon the committee to include that association, quote, to the right of the line in the procession to the memorial. Atkinson seemed amenable to this idea, but at least one member of the committee balked at it. That member consulted with Hallowell, who then consulted with the veteran officers of the regiment. They agreed that the Shaw Veteran Association should march to the right as escort to members of the 54th, 55th, and 5th Cavalry, the three African-American regiments from Massachusetts. 
Hallowell noted, somewhat cynically, that the 35 men of the Straw Association, quote, with their tattered battle flag, would be the feature of the parade to excite the tears and cheers of the multitude. Still, the arguing continued about which men of color to include, just the veterans of the 54th, veterans of all three Massachusetts res regiments, men who served in the Civil War Navy. In the end, these four units did march, but members of the Shaw Association were not permitted to do so unless they had served in one of those four units. The two African-American Massachusetts posts of the Grand Army of the Republic, the Robert A. Bell Post of Boston and the Robert Gould Shaw Post of New Bedford, were also not invited to take part in the procession or the later music hall cer ceremony. Another question of African-American participation involved those music hall events. Hallowell had picked five African-American Civil War veterans to serve as his staff for the unveiling. Among them was Charles L. Mitchell, a member of the 55th and one of the handful of African-American soldiers to receive a commission as second lieutenant near the end of the war. He later represented Boston's sixth ward in the state legislature. Mitchell had been a pallbearer and his wife, Nellie Brown Mitchell, a soloist at William Lloyd Garrison's funeral. And he suggested to Atkinson that his wife might sing the Star Spangled Banner at the music hall. She could be flanked, he proposed, by two Civil War heroes, the famed 54th Sergeant William H. Kearney, who seized the regiment's American flag at Wagner's parapet and did not let it touch the ground, and Jack Redding, one of the crew of the Union Sloop of War Kearsage when it sank the Confederate vessel Alabama in 1864. Atkinson did not like the idea, and he proposed instead that, quote, as many of the colored people of Boston might be massed in a suitable manner near the monument to sing John Brown's body as the troops approached the memorial. This proposal evidently was no more attractive to Mitchell than Mitchell's was to Atkinson, so neither one occurred. <laughs> Hallowell appears to have left to his five-man staff the responsibility of assembling the battalion of survivors. Mitchell, a printer by trade who had once worked on Garrison's abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator, published three circulars to the survivors of the 54th, 55th, 5th Cavalry and the Civil War Navy, asking them to take part in the Shaw Memorial dedication and to wear their uniforms if they could. The Bell GAR post provided the veterans with a hall in which to gather, prepare, and rest. To all veterans from a distance who had signaled their intention to attend the unveiling, Mitchell and his committee issued a printed card listing the home of four African-American women in which these men might stay because it remained difficult and often impossible for even celebrated African-Americans to stay in Boston hotels. In the end, according to the Boston Herald, 144 veterans of the four African-American Civil War units attended the unveiling of the Shaw Memorial. The Boston papers noted that at least one veteran had traveled 1,500 miles to attend and that others came from the South and Midwest. 65 of them were veterans of the 54th. Days before the event, the papers had reported the detailed rules and order of the procession, which included 12 units of marching men in addition to the parade marshal and staff at the front and Governor Roger Walcott and his party at the rear. The New York 7th, which received far more attention from the Boston press than the 54th, was seventh in the order. The battalion of survivors was ninth, with the mostly white officers forming the first platoon and the, quote, sections of colored men after. Nowhere were the 65 members of the 54th, much less all 144 African-American veterans, identified by name, not even in the official history of the dedication. I was able through other sources to document only 29 men from these units who took part in the ceremonies that day. Veteran 54th Lieutenant William L. Whitney described the procession for the absent regimental historian Luis Emilio. Whitney noted that a fine rain came down throughout the day and that the 54th had the head of the line after six or eight companies of military escort. He added, when the head of column reached Joy Street going up Beacon, the escort halted and lined up next to the memorial. 
When it was unveiled, the Signal Corps on top of the State House signaled the Navy in the harbor and the artillery on the common both firing salutes. Swales, I think, was mounted and on Hallowell's staff. Directly behind the lieutenants came Alec Johnson, drummer, a U.S. colors carried by Sergeant Kearney, the Putnam flag by Lieutenant Wilkins, followed by about 60 men. After them, the 55th and then the 5th Cavalry. De Morty was on hand with a covered wagon in which he took care of coats and umbrellas and from which he issued white gloves, caps, or blouses to all the men who needed them. I think the parade was a great success. Of course, the weather was against us, but it was a success, and we, went, we met with a great applause all along the line. Just for background, Swales was Stephen Swales, who, like Charles Mitchell, was commissioned a lieutenant in the 54th, even though the War Department initially refused to muster him in at that rank. Alec Johnson was Alexander Howard Johnson, who was a 16-year-old mariner from New Bedford when he enlisted and served as a drummer for the regiment. For many years, Johnson and others claimed that he was the model for one of the drummers on the memorial, though St. Gaudens did not use any actual 54th members as models. James H. Wilkins was a 54th sergeant born in North Carolina. De Morty was Mark René De Morty, a native of Norfolk, Virginia, who'd lived in Boston since 1855 and was also a very active fugitive assistant. He was the 54th settler, the man who sold provisions to soldiers, and clearly played a similar role in the procession. De Morty actively supported the troops' long campaign to achieve pay equal to that of white soldiers. During the war, he extended credit to the black members of the 54th, but he did not extend the same courtesy to the regiment's white officers, even though they, like the troops, received no pay at all until the War Department finally agreed to equal pay in June of 1864. Hallowell's prediction that the veterans with their tattered flag would be a popular feature of the procession turned out to be correct. The Boston Globe called their presence, quote, touching and much the most interesting feature of the event, quote, here were men who had been soldiers in the most realistic sense and whose direct identification with the events commemorated made their presence something never to be forgotten by those who saw them. Some of them bore the marks of battle upon their persons and forced tears to the eyes of many who had thus brought vividly home to their minds the heroic event of which these men were part. St. Gaudens' relection of the unveiling was somewhat more specific. He said, the regiment that came nearest to us comprised the remaining officers and colored men of the 54th Massachusetts whom Shaw had led, the bas-relief itself being within 30 or 40 feet of where the colors were presented to them by Governor Andrew before Colonel Shaw started on the march to his death. At the unveiling, there stood before the relief 65 of these veterans. Some of the officers were clad in the uniforms they had worn during the Civil War and rode on horseback but the Negro troops came in their time-worn frock coats, coats used only on great occasions. Many of them were bent and crippled, men with white heads, some with bouquets, and the inevitable humorous touch, one with a carpet bag. The, <laughs> the impression of those old soldiers passing the very spot where they left for the war so many years before thrills me even as I write these words. After the unveiling, those who took part in the procession and their invited guests went to the music hall for an afternoon of speeches and pageantry. Atkinson had delegated the matter of invitations to committee member Henry Lee with a proviso that, quote, no one might be forgotten who had even a remote claim to be present. Lee left behind a list of 423 names to whom tickets were dispersed, some from 15 to 30 to a single in individual to fight whom they wished. Not one person on Lee's list was African American. Atkinson asked Lee for four tickets more than the 16 he originally received and also asked that two of those four be quote added in the gallery where you intend to place the colored friends of the colored soldiers for whom Lee had reserved 14 rows on one side below the stage. 
segregating people of color in the gallery of a public assemb assembly hall or a church was a long-lived and disreputable custom in the South, and that it should have prevailed at an event celebrating interracial cooperation is a stunning example of Northern hypocrisy. That it insulted the families of the African men who, the African American men who had risked their lives in the war seems beyond question, at least to me. One last group of oddities about the music hall ceremonies. After William James spoke, Booker T. Washington gave a shorter address in which he stated that the Shaw Memorial must stand, quote, for effort, not victory complete. The real monument, he said, quote, is slowly but safely builded among the lowly in the South, in the struggles and sacrifices of a race to justify all that has been done and suffered for it, as if white Americans had been lifting, if not propping up, black Americans since the nation began. Washington was wholeheartedly part of the whitewash of support for sectional reconciliation that had hold of the United States at the time. And he declared that to disheartened Confederate veterans, quote, there can be no prouder reward for defeat than by the supreme effort to place the Negro on that footing where he will add material, intellectual, and civil strength to every department of state. No one in the audience who had even a passing familiarity with the American South, black or white, can have failed to have found this statement incredible, if not ludicrous. Toward the end of his address, Washington noticed Sergeant Carney among the veterans on the floor. He later wrote, quote, when I turned to address the colored regiment and referred to Sergeant Carney, he rose as if by instinct with a flag in his hands. It has been my privilege to witness a good many satisfactory and rather sensational demonstrations in connection with several of my public addresses. But in dramatic effect, I have never seen nor experienced anything that equaled the impression made on the audience when Sergeant Carney rose. For a good many minutes, the audience seemed to entirely lose control of itself and patriotic feeling was at a high pitch. Upon this display, Governor Walcott is said to have sprung to his feet and proclaimed three cheers for Booker T. Washington, as though Washington himself, not Shaw, Kearney, and the rest of the 54th had fought the war, as though Washington was being honored at the Shaw Memorial dedication. In the evening of the un unveiling, Boston's African American community staged its own event at Faneuil Hall. Here the Mitchells accomplished what they had hoped to do at the music hall. Nellie Brown Mitchell sang the Star Spangled Banner with Charles Redding holding a Union Jack on one side and Carney with the Fort Wagner American flag on the other. At this meeting, both white and African Americans sat on the stage and both gave speeches. And while the music hall ceremonies, by all accounts, offered no critique of the current racial climate, the African American speakers at Faneuil Hall did. Boston African-American attorney Edward Everett Brown, according to the Boston Herald, quote, denounced the bigotry and injustice which he said were shown toward colored people at the present time, notwithstanding their heroism and bravery in the war. The Herald noted that, quote, many of the colored speakers spoke in the same vein. The paper reported that George T. Downing, a well-known African-American activist and an integrationist who longed for a colorblind world, quote, called down shame because, he said, colored Americans are unjustly treated on all sides, discouraged in their attempts to demand respect and pursue happiness. Clearly, whether the Shaw Memorial unveiling was, as the Boston Globe put it, a great day for the colored race throughout this country was open to question. There's no time here to delve into the complicated and dispiriting historical moment in which the Shaw Memorial was dedicated, except to say that it was among the lowest of low points between the end of Reconstruction and the rise of the Niagara Movement, the predecessor to the NAACP. No copies of the sole <coughs> African-American newspaper published in Boston at the time of the unveiling have survived, and the event was barely mentioned in African-American newspapers in other cities that I was able to review. Still, there is ample evidence that many African-American soldiers respected <coughs> and even revered Robert Gould Shaw, 
and that they regarded their service with great pride. They had, after all, fought for, <coughs> fought for a cause of real meaning in their own lives. African Americans, Americans who fought in the Civil War and those who appreciated their service clearly saw the memorial as a watershed. The Shah, in fact, became almost instantly Boston's African American War Memorial. It was the site of every African American Memorial Day observance, every effort to mark the disastrous Battle of Fort Wagner and Shaw's death, every gathering of African American veterans in the city of Boston. This may seem odd, given the overwhelming role of whites in creating the memorial, but there is no evidence that white veterans ever contested African Americans' virtually exclusive use of the Shah. White Civil War veterans held their ceremonies at Martin Milmore's Soldiers and Sailors Monument near the center of Boston Common, which was installed in 1877. I have argued that Milmore's bas reliefs showing the departure from and return of troops to Boston may have been part of St. Gaudens' inspiration for his depiction of the men of the 54th on the memorial. But other than the students of the largely white Robert Gould Shaw School in nearby Roxbury, almost everyone who used the Shaw as a ceremonial site was African American until it became the site of anti-war and other protests in the 1960s. Opponents of the use of busing to desegregate Boston's public schools climbed all over the monument in 1973. Still, the Shaw Memorial has retained a power to speak about race and justice. In 1983, the late Boston theologian Peter Gomes called the Shaw, quote, a great unfinished work in the endless march to that just and perfect day. It was much the same notion that Booker T. Washington had expressed at the Music Hall in 1897. And it was much like Joshua Bowen Smith's response when African-American New Yorkers asked him to help create a Charles Sumner monument after Sumner died in 1874. Smith loved Sumner, and to his mind, carrying on the work that Sumner had begun was a more fitting memorial to the man. Still, he allowed that a Sumner monument might inspire Americans to be like Sumner, who he described as, quote, a light so bright that will wake up, I'm sorry, a light so bright that will wake up this sleepy nation to a sense of justice. In a similar way, the Shaw Memorial speaks to one moment of interracial effort toward a common goal, and it offers a hope that someday such a thing will be more than a moment. The end. Questions? Good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Are there any questions? Yeah. Do people gather there these days? Um, God, you look awful familiar to me. You do. Um, um, I honestly, I don't think so, but I don't know for sure, to tell you the truth. I stopped around, I don't know when I stopped my study. It was probably in the 70s to 80s. I really don't know. Does any, is there anybody here from BOAF or Boston National Historical Park? I'm not from either of those places, but in connection with the recent rededication, right. they set up a tent where they had documentation uh, all through the history, and many of, of the documentation was photographs of unusual occurrences mm -hmm. at at the monument, oh, yeah. different ways that it was used for yeah. commemorations, including during the anti-war 60s. Right. But all along, there's been things going on. There's been kind of a hotbed of pop-up events of all. Yeah, sorts. right. So those pictures are worth tracking down. Yeah. Now. Anyone else? I'm aware in the 60s of demonstrations uh, uh, on the steps of the State House facing the monument mm -hmm. of um, Bill Baird, who was a activist in promoting um, the ability of contraception being pr uh, available oh. to women. Huh. And uh, so that resonates for me, that memory, with uh, the expression of other civil rights that uh, the monument engenders. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, I got to ask a question. Um, there are three uh, St. Gaudens, 54th monuments. One here, one in, in Boston, and then there's one in Washington, D.C. Do you have any sense of the how the inter how the the installation in the National Gallery is interpreted? I really don't. Would that be an interesting conversation between the three places? It would be, yes. Yeah. Has the one that's here always been here? Thank God, folks. This one came in 1997, the one that you saw this morning, and that was a recasting of a later plaster version that you can now see in the National Gallery of Art. So 100 years after it was unveiled on Boston Common, there was one bronze version unveiled here. Uh -huh. And that bronze version was based on the one in D.C.? Yes, yeah. It was here before that, and then it went to the National Gallery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was your biggest surprise while you were doing your research? Oh boy. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I suppose this this sort of persistent um, level of they always distinguish they in those days between political and social equality. Like it's okay if African Americans have political rights, but I still don't want my daughter to marry, that sort of thing. The level of social racism that was, that just permeates the North mm -hmm. during this whole period, even in connection with something <coughs> that's supposed to speak counter to that, I suppose was fairly surprising because I'm not, my, my primary work had been pre-Civil War stuff. I had really not done a great deal until this study with populations after the Civil War. So I guess the persistence and that's not only the persistence but the pervasiveness of that level of social inequality was somewhat surprising. Yeah, I guess. Carried into World War II. Oh yeah. I mean it did, it really didn't matter. You think I mean these guys thought if I participate in this war, as they had in the revolution, as they had in the War of 1812, if I take part in this war and fight for my country, when I come out, I'm going to be treated like a human being and equal to everybody else. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in the Spanish-American War. It doesn't happen after World War I. It doesn't happen after World War II. So it's just a, it's a, a horribly persistent theme in our, in our history. And what Part of what's really bad about that is the the, um, the people who the men who served um, weren't eligible for the GI Bill. That <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, which, which automatically put them down in a um, scale of poverty right. compared to you know what the white soldiers right. were able to ascertain. Right. Anything else? What did you find the most interesting about your, your work? About? About your study. What, what did you think was the most interesting that you found in your research? Uh, just the fact that if there were, and I'm sure there were, African American people in Boston who, who actually pledged to have this memorial built, and the fact that they're essentially erased from any trace of participation or interest in the memorial really was your question what's most surprising or no that was the other question yeah. what did you yeah, what did you find the most interesting about I find that most interesting and, and most um, disappointing they didn't even bother to find them I mean they didn't even bother to, to track down the people who had pledged and that after a point they basically cut Joshua Bowen Smith out of all of the memorial planning. He was still alive until 1879, when they were really getting back up. You know, after Sumner dies, they start to reinvigorate the whole thing. He's still living, but he's not. They just don't consider him somebody who needs to be consulted anymore. 
that bothers me. Yes. Is, is there, if I'm understanding this correctly, is there any way to rectify this and kick ass? Somewhere? Well, <laughs> the one thing they did finally do, and they, they discussed this and debated it and argued about it for months on end, was um, putting the names of the African American soldiers who had died at Fort Wagner on the back of the memorial. They had discussed it and discussed it. It just didn't happen until the 1980s. So um, that's the only kick-ass thing I know of. That, <laughs> and that's, I can't really say that that's, I don't really know. I, I just do history. I don't really think too much about, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> so this is a non-history question. It's the role that these monuments play in our contemporary society. From what you talk about, um, you know, until now, it really didn't change the landscape and change people's minds on what they thought, <coughs> who and what black people are. Yeah. But what do you think the role of the monument is in our, in our society now, since we have more, is it changing? Or is it I thing? think it could change. In I mean, I think it could be interpreted in a much broader way than I believe it is interpreted now. Um, and the problem is, I think, that, in part anyway, is that the only way it's interpreted now is through maybe a blurb in the, in the Boston African American National Historical Site Black History Trail brochure and by interpreters at BOEF. And I'm not blaming them or casting, saying anything about them, but it's not a very permanent or enduring way to interpret them. There needs to be something that really interprets the monument more broadly. Um, at the monument. I don't know how that could be accommodated, but I think that that would help. I mean, Byron Rushing once said, oh, I love this statement, that people who were waiting for a bus in front of the Shaw Memorial learned more about black history than most people in Boston did, just from having stared at it. And I think by itself, it is a pretty provocative memorial. But the point, you, you can't just make it provocative and then just leave it there. Someone has to take that sense of that trigger and do something with it. Um, at the rededication of the, of, the, of the memorial, we did not get this sense of the complicatedness. Right. We still got the whole glossed over story. Right. You know? So it's just, again, mind-boggling to think that we have these opportunities where we can engage and change the way we look at things, and we still overlook those opportunities yeah. all the time. It is. Yes. Uh, do you uh, are you aware of uh, like how much um, black skin people were involved on the Confederate side as soldiers? No, I'm not aware of that. Yeah. Didn't study that part. No, yeah. nothing to do with the Confederates. Google it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, did you use primary sources? Um, yes. In your research, and if so, did any of them come from the families of the soldiers in the 54th? Uh, almost none. Um, there's a few Sergeant Carney's things that I have. Um, I can cons he wrote several letters recounting his own um, experience at Fort Wagner, and they were published in the newspaper. There's not m much else that Carney wrote, a few other things that Carney wrote. Wesley Furlong, who I mentioned, also wrote a little bit about it. He named his son uh, Robert Gould Shaw Furlong and loved Shaw, really loved Shaw. There's a little bit that he wrote, but there's not a great deal, no. There really isn't much. There, it, may, they, it may exist. I just couldn't find it. It could be in homes, it could be in repositories that I don't know about. Part of this research was done during COVID, which made it hard to go to some places, but um, if it exists, I, I didn't find it. There were quite a number of the descendants at this unveiling. Yeah. Um, rededication. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know if anybody's ever talked to them. Yeah, or if they have papers. Yeah. Yeah. I did talk to some of those people, but I didn't find much in the way of uh, documenting their ideas and feelings about the memorial, which was what I was charged with, with doing. Yeah? I want to thank you and thank the Black Heritage Trail for doing what you said could be done, which is to use the memorial to re- to, to speak in a broader way. And something you said today, I mean, I feel like why, maybe everybody else probably knows this, but 
now today I know it, um, of seeing it as a, um, a depiction of cooperation between us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen it as, yes, African Americans were fighting for their own freedom too, almost a statement against the people who say it was done unto them. And I've also seen Shaw in that light as, you know, stay away from the great white savior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But today you gave me a different view. And even just what you said about a man naming his son after this person and what Shaw was like, but also to see it as a, as a possibility of cooperation mm -hmm. is a new vision for me. So thank you. Yeah, in fact, Shaw was not, I never regarded himself as an abolitionist. So, and uh, his mind certainly did change, and he wrote many letters, so you can really document this, uh, about the way his ideas changed. But m more so, the, um, from the, from the African-American side of it, they respected him because he wasn't an abolitionist, because they, didn't, they felt like he was going to be an even hand. And he, they weren't going to... You know, it wasn't going to be a sort of an abolitionist fury that fought for, fought for equal pay or uniforms like everyone else. It was going to be a military guy who just saw that this wasn't right and that that was a better thing. So it's, it's a pretty complicated relationship between the two, I think. So we're running toward the end of this program. So let's just give the Catherine one more. So she's not modest. We do have copies of her special history report here, which really has changed the way that we think about the memorial and is an ongoing process of continuing research, of continuing to disseminate this. And we only have a few um, printed copies, but it's, this is all free to download on our website. It's not, it's, it's a lot of information, but this is all out there for everyone's um, access. I'm curious, how did you get funding for that? That was through the National Park Service, through the larger National Park Service in just this park. Yes. Um, there was a, some really interesting conversation about the, the three Shaw Memorials, the Shaw 54th Memorials in the world today. There's the one in Boston, um, on the commons, where the soldiers marched. It's part of Boston African American National Historic Site. Um, so it's really where these events took happen, took took place. There's one in the National Gallery of Art, sort of a place of celebrating artistic mastery and where it can be in conversation with many other different pieces of art. And there's one here, the place where it was created, but also a place of creativity writ large to celebrate creativity in many different forms. So to wrap up this, we'll be um, watching a newly composed um, video of a song created for this unveiling of the Shah 54th Memorial. Um, it was created um, in a partnership with the National Park Service, the City of Boston, the Friends of the, the Boston Public Gardens, and the Museum of African American History of Boston and Nantucket. And it was composed by a man named Julius Williams. Julius Williams, he's the music director and conductor of the Berkeley Contemporary Symphony Orchestra. He's a composer in many different genres, um, including opera, ballet, orchestra, and dance. And we're after, um, after this, we're going to head into the little studio, the place where St. Gaudens was working, but one of the most creative places here at the park to sort of continue this, this tradition and to um, hear the song, Those Heroes Who Healed the Nation, which was inspired by the words of the African-American poet, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, along with the words of Frederick Douglass. Um, and it's performed by the Boston Children's Choir um, at the Shaw 54th um, Boston Commons. Um, so we're gonna head inside here and we'll show that.